wouldn't you like to know God's will for your life? God's will. What is God's will? For us to want to know what it is for our life, we have to know what it is in the first place, right? And, you know, we obviously have, I think we have concepts of will, right? In the sense that we have a, a strong-willed child. What's that mean? Well, the child has certain desires, and it's going to go do whatever is necessary to do them. Perhaps there's some strong willed people here. Perhaps all of us here have a degree of strong willedness. And then we have a, another concept of will in the sense of we, we have a will for when we pass away that our desires for what to be done after we're gone, that we can't speak for ourselves, that, that this piece of paper will say what needs to be done. That our desires and our commands will be followed out. And so that's will, right? God's will has to do with his desires, his commands, obligations of others in response to these. And then what is God going to do to bring them about? Those are all concepts that are are tied up into the statement that we can sometimes throw around, you know, God's will. Okay, so that, that establishes what it is. And probably with this audience, you, you, you do know about it. And you would like to know more about it, because there would just be a peace of mind if, you know, wake up each day and what I'm doing is falling into alignment with God's will. That, and that's, a, that's an interesting concept to, to try to, to align all that we do. Why is that there? Why, why do we have that in an innate desire? Even maybe people who do not believe in God may have a, a, a similar desire that they hope to wake up and whatever they're doing is falling in alignment with what the, the cosmos is doing. So, we have to go back to in the beginning. In the beginning, God created man in his, man in his image. Male and female, he created them. Both genders were made to almost as mirrors, I can use that illustration, as mirrors, as God, who he is, beams down and it, uh, shines off these mirrors, male and female, that he's created, he's formed with his hands and breathes the breath into, they then reflect out onto creation and to the animals you know, and, and plants, everything, that, that God is good and these are his ways. Like man was designed to fall in line with God's will. To make it known, to make known how good and glorious God is. That's what it means to be made for all mankind, to be made in God's image. And this is, and again, I alluded to, unbelievers, people who do not believe in God, have a desire. And it's because this image of God isn't completely erased away by the fall of man. It's, it's not just a garden thing, you know, the Garden of Eden. It continues this day. That's, that's why James could say, uh, James, a half-brother of Jesus, in his uh, letter can say about taming the tongue, that the damage that we do is like a wildfire, right? One moment we are blessing God with our tongue, and then the next we're cursing man who's created in his image. And James doesn't qualify like, well, man who are saved, who goes to church, who is good, who da 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 da. He doesn't do that. He just leaves it at man. So we, we, we know that all mankind is designed, is obligated to reflect God. Reflect God. And it's taking place. 
God will receive the glory from this creation. But now as believers who have a mind of God, a heart, and a heart from God, a spirit from God that wants them to obey Him, that we've tasted that the ways of God are good, we want to take part in that will, God. We want to be like Jesus who cried out, not my will, but your will be done when facing the cross. So how do we do that? How do we practically live like that? Well, I think, uh, again, we're going to go into a, a five-part series. This is the first one. Um, they're going to be on the topic of God's will, but I'm going to try to stay in it, just a few texts. Uh, so that way you can spend time there, uh, sit under that word, sit there with the Holy Spirit, and, and you're in the time alone and just really soak in that particular text. Obviously the Bible is great. We can go to lots of places and get the kind of a um, reinforcing message that gives us almost like a, a diamond, right? A, um, it's, it's one object, but as you turn it, the light shines through it and it reflect, reflects differently. You see different beauty of the truth. That's kind of how the Bible operates. But I want you to just kind of sit under one. And so we're going to sit on Deuteronomy chapter 29 today. Because so what I want to do is fight almost a burden that Christians can have. A burden that we place upon ourselves because we, we try to take on too much. Too much of trying to know God's will. So Deuteronomy 29, 29 is the, the particular verse. And then we'll talk about the context. But let's just read 29, 29. The secret things belong to the Lord our God. But the things that reveal belong to us and to our children forever that we may do all the words of this law. In your handout, I have it colored differently, right? The, kind of like almost like part one and part two of that verse. The secret things, and then the other half is the revealed things. So God's will, it's so big, it encompasses secret things and things that, that he's told us. Why is that, um, why is he saying that right now? And why is that applicable to us today? Well, why is he saying it? If you looked at chapter 29, and, and as, you know, as we you know, read it earlier, you see that he makes some great promises. And let's look, let's look at um, verse 13, for instance. Let's start reading verse, I'll, I'll read verse 13, and just to refresh us that he may establish you as his people, and that he may be your God, as he promised you, and as he sworn to your fathers, to Abraham, to Isaac, to Jacob. And it's not with you alone that I'm making the sworn covenant, but whoever is standing here with us today, before the Lord our God, and whoever is not here with us today. Wow. So whoever's here, and whoever's not. God's going to make this covenant that, that these people will be his people. He will be their God. That sounds great. But the interesting thing, God continues and, and he impacts how these people that are standing here today, their generations, are going to turn away from God again. And, or actually turn away, we're in Deuteronomy. They're going to turn away from God. They're going to follow after the, the idols, the false gods of, of other nations. One's made of gold. And, you know, God is a, a God of justice. Yes, he's a God of mercy, but he, to be a just, job, a just God, he can't let the murderer go unpunished. He can't say, here's a $45 fine, pay the bailiff as you go, we'll just cover up this murder you did. And so, Israel, when you entered this covenant with me, I gave you the, the stipulations of what will happen. And so, in the, the other bulk part of chapter 29, 
He goes and tells them that there will be a day that you will turn away. And I'm going to have to do this, reading in, in, uh, in verse 27. Therefore the anger of the Lord was kindled against this land, bringing upon it all the curses written in this book. And the Lord uprooted them from their land in anger and fury and great wrath, and cast them into another land as they are to this day. Meaning, you're going to continue to disobey me. I'm going to show mercy upon mercy, send prophet upon prophet. You're going to kill them. And eventually I'm going to bring these other invading armies upon you to be a, a rod of my discipline. And you're going to be distributed in other nations. But you've got to kind of think like, okay, God, as I'm standing here, you're, you're telling me that you're going to be a God of these people, and yet these people are going to turn away, and you're going to have to do these things. You're going to have to do some things in your anger. How's this work? And this almost reminds me of a cartoon, uh, you know, Bugs Bunny, right? And the, if my memory serves me right, like Elmer Fudd or another character would, would um, come up to Bugs Bunny, kind of a little, um, maybe shake him because he just got, you know, just ran into a tree because he was chasing bugs and, and he doesn't even recognize Bugs Bunny. And then he, Elmer Fudd asks Bugs Bunny, like, which way did he go? I think that was a horrible Elmer Fudd. But, and then uh, Bugs was like, eh, that way. And, and as Elmer Fudd looks at the, the, you know, two opposite directions that don't make sense, he kind of tries to start and he falls on his backside. Right? You can almost feel like that's what's going on in this text. Like, okay, God, you have us going this way one moment, and it sounds great, but then how, how does this end up going that way? And then so he smacks and ends this dialogue, uh, at least the, this section with verse 29 that, that we're studying today, that the secret things belong to the Lord. It's almost like with the, the prophet Habakkuk. The prophet Habakkuk asked God a question, like, how can you use this evil army to discipline us? How can you use someone unrighteous against us? And God says, even if I told you what was going to take place, you wouldn't believe it. So there, there are these things that, are, that God will bring about, and he will still maintain the cause of the good and, and keep his good plan some things need to take place that aren't gonna aren't gonna look like they're they're heading in this direction. But yet he'll take care of it. We need to trust him. We need to have faith in him that that even as circumstances seem dark and gloomy and just bad, that God is in control. See, it, it's like this as we as we read the Bible, right? We have a statement, in the beginning is God, and he created the heavens and the earth. And at the end of the Bible, we, we have the statement that you know, this, we won't even need a sun, the physical sun. We won't need it because we will see God and Jesus face to face, and they will be our light. Okay. God, there's a bunch of question marks on, on, in, in this ark and I'm not seeing how this lines up. Can you imagine some of the, the people before Jesus? God, how's this happening? But that, that's the thing, right? Even as things went kind of, kind of hope is lost. There's no descendant of, you know, who can possibly be a descendant from Abraham, David, Judah, David. You know, who can be this king of Israel that all the nations would bow down to? Who could be the one to take away the sins and the curses that fell upon Adam's race? Who? No one was expecting this baby born in a, in a um, basically nowhere. He wasn't given a, 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 you know, a, a grand entry. It was a small entry. The angels celebrated. A few shepherds below the society. Who would have thought that all history would accumulate, accumulate in this one person who would then live a perfect life, die a perfect death, one that 
drinks up all the sin of Adam's race, and then conquers death and sin, resurrects from the, from the grave, so we have an empty tomb, and then it is seated, resurrected, as Savior and Lord in heaven. Jesus. So our end is guaranteed by what Jesus has done. And we live in a time where things are a little confusing, a little difficult, more than a little, right? We hear about new explosions. We hear about what um, the latest thing ISIS is doing. We hear about different other countries' leaders like North Korea and Russia. It just seems like things don't change, do they? Maybe not on that scale. And in some ways, you know, they're... they're Things aren't new under the sun, right? But there is this continuum of how man responds to circumstances and where it goes. But this is what we get back to a believer's opportunity. Right? We may struggle with all the unknowns. We may struggle with the unknown of what the next president of the United States is going to do. We may struggle with what we're going to do in our workplace as people are being laid off. Or even what job field should I, should I go into if I'm uh, younger in life or second uh, career path or um, what college, you know, who should be my spouse, should I have a spouse, what about children, how do children factor in in these, this, day, this age. How do we go about all this stuff, God? Because I want your will. A lot of these things are, are I, I wish there was a verse that would just make it very clear on who should be my spouse, God. God, couldn't you give me a verse to say this is what I should do with my life? Unfortunately, that's where something a lot of Christians can land and spend too much time. In kind of holding pattern. A holding pattern, and there are holding patterns in seasons of life, don't get me wrong, but ones that, you know, your, your mind is just always on the next thing. It's not in the present, seeing what God's doing in, in your midst. So, so we don't need to be out there, we need to be here. And yeah, so we need a plan, but, but, we, need, but we need to, to, to take steps each day. And so that's, the, the, I think, the beauty of this verse. Because it says, yeah, there, God, there's some things, as you look out, uh, you know, that, uh, <laughs> those are some tall mountains. That, that, those are some big valleys. And I don't know how this is going to work out. And even as we take steps, we may not understand it until we look in a rearview mirror. Perhaps we'll get to heaven and, and we'll be so enthralled with what, what all is going on, we won't even remember all these kind of questions. And the reason why we, you know, we can have that confidence is because the second part of Deuteronomy 29. 29. That God has revealed stuff to us. Very specific things. Statements that say, this is God's will for your life. And the problem is not that he hasn't given us specific specificity, is that we that we box those statements in to only apply to certain aspects of life. But here's the thing that scripture says more times, do God's will, do God's will more times than discern or know God's will. It says that statement, right? That there's times when we need refreshers. Don't get me wrong. Scripture definitely says that. But if you could count those up, I believe do God's will is actually mentioned more times. And so that means that if, if God is telling us to do that, he's provided a way for us to do that. To touch these, these decisions. And so while things look kind of... Uh, kind of shaky, kind of difficult. When people look at us, it's not that we're not impacted. It's not that we don't have compassion. It's not that we're not, we don't get unfeeling. 
because of our, our knowledge. But that there is a steadiness of us, uh, for us. That we're, we're planted on a rock. Right? So that when the, the waves come, the, the storm, and the, with the driving rain and the wind, we, we stay planted. We stay planted on the hope and joy in Jesus Christ. That nothing can touch. Whatever comes our way, it may hurt, it may cause some legitimate grief, but it cannot subtract from the joy that we have in Jesus Christ. And so I think that is a, the, the, our first kind of guiding principle to this study of God's will. Is that there are things that we get burdened with that are part of God's secret will. And so we need to trust Him. And there are things that we probably aren't burdened as much as we should be. And we need to allow those to, to kind of come on our shoulders. But in both these things, right, we need to cast these burdens that, that we're carrying, that we shouldn't be carrying, upon the Lord, upon Jesus Christ, and as, as we, we feel this load, this load will even be light because Jesus is carrying it with us. Right? For his yoke is easy and his burden is light because he is the one that's uh, carrying us. So as we go in this study, well, I, I pray and encourage you to kind of have some thoughts. Have, journal. What, what am I carrying that I shouldn't be? How much is this election bothering me? You know, the November, the November election, it, it's, uh, it's not pretty. But the thing is, none of us know the future. We don't know what God could do with either character because he's used wicked people before, like a Nebuchadnezzar. So, both are equally valid. We're offended by some of the policies, maybe, by a certain candidate. But we ultimately don't know, even if, let's say, we don't get a person with good policies, that, you know, how God will work through that. Because America is not in Scripture. It is a nation, like many others, the God is God of. He's a God of many nations, many tribes, many languages. And from all those, God will take people to be His. So in heaven, there will be representatives from every tribe, nation, and tongue. That doesn't take away from the, the value of America. But it does kind of Say, you know, God, not my will, but your will be done. I vote with my conscience this election. I don't know who is God's willed um, candidate. That's a secret thing. And even if the guy who has the best policy wins, I have no guarantee that he's going to follow through with it. So no matter what, God, the wickedness of that person will fall upon their head. Because so I'm delegating my votes to someone to be righteous. And you're placing someone in power authority to be righteous. And if they aren't righteous in their ruling, they'll stand before you. Wow. That kind of lightens up my burden when I go in the voting booth. What other things in our life are we doing that with? That we're, we're allowing to carry us down. And like I said, part two is, God, where am I not considering your will? Because if I'm creating the image of God, if all my life, and now that you know, I've come to a place where I've accepted Christ, and I want you to receive um, credit, glory from how I live, I want people to look on me and look my life, which so shine for man, that they would glorify you in heaven. Am I compartmentalizing certain aspects of my life and saying, well, this is mine, 
This is Holy Sunday, but this day is mine. Are there ways I'm doing that? Activities. Because whatever we're doing should reflect God. And it should really showing us to be more dependent upon Jesus Christ and becoming like Him. That's what, we're, that's what our life is supposed to be marked by. Depending upon Jesus and becoming like Him. And so I pray that this study will help you. Join me in prayer. Blessed and Father, we are so thankful for your word. We're so thankful that you do speak and, and you, you've spoken and that, that as you have spoken, it's like a rock hitting the water and then the ripples go out. That whatever word proceeds from your mouth, it will not return void. It will have its results. And so, even these words back spoken through Moses are impacting us today as we stand here, sit here as a people of God. And Father, may we trust you for the secret things and go do the words of your law. Be doers of the word, not merely hearers. Father, strengthen us. Help us not to be burdened by this because the sweet thing is that, that Jesus has purchased this life for us. This, this life of, of of uh, delight and, and, and righteousness, right, be, right? Uh, life, good works, to be lived before you. So we may not delight in them, but delight more and more in you. So Father, work mildly among us, we pray in Christ's name.